Hi everyone and welcome to this video where we're going to take a look at the official examiner's marking guide to a standards check. Now if you don't know about this there's a document called ADI 1 and it's a document issued to examiners to tell them how they should be marking standards checks and it's an official DVSA issued guide so I'm going to go through this in great detail. There are 30 pages that I'm going to go through in fact I'll show you now. This is a version I printed off and you can easily download this yourself online you can go and read through it, but the thing is, it's so easy to miss some important information. It's chapter 4 of ADI 1, and it's going to take quite a while to read through this, so I'm going to get started straight away. Let's get straight into it. And bear in mind that I have actually done the standards check myself, because at the moment, only about half of all instructors have actually taken the standards check. I did mine a few days ago, so I do know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to use my experience of that to help talk you through this. So loads and loads of useful information. If you've got a standards check coming up, this is going to be like gold dust. So it's going to be a long video, probably about an hour or two in length. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so this is chapter four, the tests of continued ability to instruct in brackets, standards check. So skills, knowledge, and understanding required. Now these first few pages, about the first 12 pages, let me just kind of set the scene and tell you what a standards check's all about. So I will get into the more kind of meaty topics from about page, I think it's page 72 onwards. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, so from page 72 onwards, it gets a bit more kind of, you know, the main meat and bones of what you want to hear. So what I'll do is below this video, I'll put um, a link to how long it is, to the, the time when I'll start talking about the main things. So if you want to skip straight through to that, you can. However, I do recommend you listen to all of this because there's lots and lots of important information. So it says, the Driving Standards Agency, and in brackets DVSA. So it's a great start, isn't it? Because already in the first sentence, they've got their own name wrong. <laughs> but if you look at the bottom, it does say, you know, it now forms part of the DVSA. So we well, yeah, let them off with that. So the Driving Standards Agency, DVSA, published the National Standard for Driver and Rider Training, NSDRT, in 2011, setting out the skills, knowledge, and understanding you need to be an effective trainer. So all this means is simply there's a thing called the NSDRT. That's a separate document I'll put a link to below. It's quite a short document compared to this, but it sets out the standards of what should be done when it comes to driver training. And I don't just mean things like you've got to do manoeuvres and you've got to do this and that. It tells you more like in some ways a psychological thing you should be teaching people, the skills people need, not just how to do a manoeuvre, but what they should be able to do, um, how they should be able to drive, when they go to take a driving test. So a very useful document though, if you haven't already seen it, go and check it out. And it carries on. Uh, the aim of the standards check is to let you assess, because remember this is written for examiners, so it's talking to examiners. The aim of the standards check is to let you assess the ADI's ability to instruct and whether their instruction helps a person to learn in an effective way. The standards check will be conducted with you observing the ADI delivering a normal one hour lesson. That's the joke, isn't it? A normal one hour lesson, because of course it's going to be a normal lesson with an examiner sitting in the back. <laughs> it's nothing like a normal lesson, we all know that. Anyway, the ADI, the ADI is responsible for the standards check lesson. That means that they're not going to give you any direction. They won't say where to go. They're not going to give you a topic they want you to do. That's up to you. I'm going to be going into that in great detail later on. Very important, you choose the correct topic, otherwise it all falls apart. They should make sure they have sound knowledge of the area around their chosen driving test centre, DTC, so they can plan their lesson, give appropriate directions to the people during the standards check. This is really important. You must know the area that you're teaching in. You can't turn up and say, I don't know where I'm going, or you know, I don't know around here very well. It can happen, it actually happened to me when years ago I moved to Cornwall and they sent me a standards check just as I moved to Cornwall. So brilliant, I didn't even know the area at all. I had to come back to Birmingham and do it here. Um, and it happened again, I've just moved home four weeks ago today and they sent me a standards check. I don't know what it is about when you move home. I don't know whether they pick up on that, whether they used to think, oh, he's moving, we'll give him a standards check. But moving home certainly seems to trigger off a standards check. <laughs> anyway, probably just coincidence, but you never know. So you must know the area really well. You must know exactly where to go. You've got to know it like the back of your hand. If you don't know the area, you're going to be stuck because if the people wants to go and try roundabouts and you don't know where the roundabouts are, well, you're stuck. 
I will be, I've done a separate video about what to do if you don't know the area, but quite simply, you can use a sat nav. You've only got to plan a simple route, you know, it depends on your people, but I will have done a separate video about what to do if you don't know the area. Um, so let's carry on. The people I bring can be at any level of ability, but cannot be on the IDI register or have passed the IDI part two test. So you can take anyone you want. It could be a learner, complete beginner. They can be trained up to test standards, as my pupil was. <coughs> it can be, um, can be an um, advanced lesson, not, um, not if they pass part two, but you can actually do a part two lesson as your standards check. It can be a full license holder, someone who's been driving for longer than you have, maybe. It can be anyone except for an instructor or anyone who's training and has passed part two. And I'm guessing that's because Otherwise, you would be a bit like cheating, wouldn't it? You could kind of fix it between you because they'd know what to do to get you a good result. So, yeah, could be anyone you want at all. Can be a neighbour, can be a relative, can be a friend, can be a random person off the street you've never met before. You can do that. Um, what happens if you turn up without people? Well, again, I've covered that in a different video. So, you know, there are lots of videos available for me. If you check those out, they may not all be available at the time of watching this one, but I'm currently filming them all, so they should be. So let's move on to the next paragraph. Now, I'm not going to rush through this, but I'm going through this fairly quick because this is fairly basic stuff. Later on, there's a lot of things you really need to know. Like I said, it's going to be quite a long video, so I want to go over these basic things fairly quickly. So it says, invite for standards check. An ADI would normally be invited for standards check at their local driving test centre. Occasionally, driving test centres or outstations are not suitable because of the restrictions they impose. So there are some test centres now where they're not actually at proper test centres. I believe some test start from universities or things like that. But some of those they weren't used because there aren't facilities for the examiner to, like, to go and rest between lessons or between tests or whatever. So normally you'll be going from your local test centre. Um, I believe it, yeah, each instructor has got like an allocated centre, which is normally the one that you're ge geographically closest to. But you can change it, you can phone them up and change it. The IDI will get a letter that confirms the time and place of their standards check and explains the test procedure. Well, it does, but again, I've done a video about this. What the letter says is actually wrong. Um, just in case you haven't seen that video, it tells you, for example, to take the people into the test centre with you. Don't do that. You don't take the people into the test centre. That's a bad idea because you're going to be talking about the people in front of the examiner. And it's strange how they always say that. They always say, take the people into the test centre. I've now, I did it once and the examiner nearly had a heart attack. He was like, what are you doing? Why have you brought the people in here? Um, you should leave them in the car. You don't want them with you when the examiner comes out. It may be different at your centre, but in my centre and the others I've used, because I've done quite a few now, um, you know, training people and doing check tests and standards checks. I've never once seen them when people have taken the people into the centre. Anyway, that's for another video. Um, types of standard check lessons. Bear in mind, this document may have changed a bit since the time I recorded this, but this is what it says at the moment. Types of standard check lessons. This is really important. Typical lesson scenario is that you may need to assess fall into the following categories. Partly trained, inexperienced learner. Experienced people about ready to take their practical driving test. New, full license holder. Experienced, full license holder. And again, I will have done a separate video about this, telling you the type of people you take. There is only four types of people you can ever take, and they'll all fall into one of those four categories. It's really, really important you get the correct category. This is what I'll be going over later on in this video. Video. So I'm going to get to our page um, 72 on where he talks about that. So it's a section 4.25, that's the page I just spoke about, sets out the typical lesson scenarios that are allowed for the standards check in more detail. Classroom based and off road lessons are not allowed for the standards check. So you can't do like, you know, an off road um, lesson on a car park or in a field or whatever. They don't allow that. It's got to be a normal everyday lesson. Conducting the standards check. An increasing number of ADIs provide training to the emergency services. This training can include taking advantage of legal exemptions such as exceeding speed limits or not complying with traffic signs. You should tell the IDR that you cannot accompany the lesson for health and safety reasons if you're told that the proposed lesson plan includes elements which require the trainee to take advantage of the exemptions. You must stop the standards check if the trainee refuses to change the lesson plan to take out these elements. So quite simply, I don't know why you do this, 
but you can't turn up in an ambulance saying you're going to do an ambulance training lesson. I don't know why you would do that anyway, but it's just saying you can't do it. They've got to kind of cover themselves, I suppose. You can't, you can't do a lesson training, you know, ambulance drivers and things like that. It says an increasing number of ADIs provide that. I certainly don't know of any that do, but that's what they say. Format of the standards check. <coughs> you must conduct all standards checks in either English or Welsh. So they must be done in English or Welsh. You can't do them in other languages. The reason is quite simply, the examiner needs to understand everything that you're saying. And um, it's important it's done in English or Welsh. Same for the driving test now. Interpreters for the purpose of translating any other language are not allowed. If an ADI requires a Welsh speaking examiner, they should request his on receipt of their invitation letter by emailing that, that email address. So yeah, if you need a Welsh speaking examiner, you can. Um, why they don't allow other languages, I could just explain, but you, you can ask them. Um, I'm not here to explain that. That's their policy, they can explain that. But it's really just because they need to make sure. Um, what used to happen, I believe, in the past is some interpreters were helping the instructor by telling them what to do. You know, and the examiner couldn't understand what they were saying because it was a different language. You will observe the ADI delivering a normal one-hour lesson with the pupil. As we've already said, it's not a normal one-hour lesson. It's nothing like a normal lesson. Um, but yeah, that's what I say. You will assess the ADI's delivery of instruction to a pupil based on a criteria set out in section 4.31, sample SC1, standards check reporting form and the national standard for driving rider training and this is why i'm making this video because you make some a real meal of all these sentences all it means is they're going to mark you against standards check marking sheet now i've already done a video about that which is 57 minutes long and i've been through every single box on the marking sheet so if you haven't already seen that that'll be close to this video somewhere else on the screen and it just simply means that they're going to mark you on that sheet and they're going to they're going to do it according to the national standards for driver and rider training, which is the document I mentioned earlier on. ADI preparation for the standards check. The people can accompany the ADI to the waiting room at the driving test centre, but we've already said, I don't recommend you do that. If the people decide to wait in the car, you should encourage the ADI to introduce the people to you in a relaxed way. Again, incorrect, the examiner will introduce themselves. I don't know why it says that in here, but... Yeah, this is the official guide, but it is a little bit different to how it actually works in reality. They should tell their people to behave exactly as they normally would. Again, how can they behave exactly as they normally would when they've got an examiner sitting in the car watching them? Um, some find that it helps to put their people at ease if they explain that the examiner is there to check the ADI is doing the job. Yep, that does work. If you tell them they're not watching you, they're not assessing you, they're assessing me, does help a lot. And to make sure that the quality of instruction they get meets the minimum standards. So yeah, that is important to tell the people they're there to assess me and not you. And it's to check, you know, to make sure you're doing your job properly. And the people just feel a bit less pressure, but there is still pressure on them. The ADI should prepare a normal lesson with their people based on the students' learning needs or agreed development strategy. So quite simply, you should do the lesson that you would normally do. Don't go and plan like a special lesson. Just do the next lesson that you would normally do without people. Again, these things I'm going to do fairly quickly. We're all getting into much more detail quite soon. Um, the theme for the lesson may be one of those listed on the SC1 form. That's the marking sheet. But it may be something else. In that case, you should record what the theme was in the other box. So it doesn't matter what topic you do. Again, manoeuvres you're not really supposed to do because they're not... They don't allow you to show your range of skills, so I don't recommend doing a manoeuvre. They don't particularly want to see that. But yeah, you can do any other topic. You can do moving off. It could be a controls lesson with a brand new beginner. It could be an advanced motorway lesson. Any topic whatsoever, but not really manoeuvres. They don't want to be seeing manoeuvres. Before the lesson starts, you'll ask the ADI some questions about their people. They should be able to tell you roughly how many hours of tuition their people has had whether their people is getting any other practice from parents or others, their people's strengths and areas for development. So yeah, quite simply, you'll turn up and they will say to you, can you tell me a bit about your people? Again, I did this just the other day. And he said, can you just tell me a bit about them? So I say, well, the name is blah, blah. They've done roughly 20 hours with me, 10 hours before that with someone else. Um, you know, they don't practice with the parents. Now, when he says tell them their strengths and areas for development, be very careful about doing that because you don't want to tell the examiner what to look out for. <laughs> Not cheating, but you don't want to go and say, oh, you know, he's normally rubbish at turning right 
And then the examiner is going to think, okay, you can tell them, but then they're going to be looking at that very closely. So it may be in your interest to not really tell them as much. Don't go into a lot of detail. So as little as you can, just say, we know, it's pretty good. Has a few problems now and then with what, well, a few things here and there. Be quite vague. Don't kind of pin yourself down and tell them, don't make their job easier than it's going to be any easier. Make them work, you know. You're not lying, you're not cheating. You don't want to go and tell them everything about your people. Give them a full half-hour debrief, you know, just a quick, like, yeah, he has a bit of trouble turning right sometimes. Maybe a bit of trouble with crossroads. And that's all you want to say. The idea I can show you the people's driving record, if they have one, before the start of the lesson to help expand their current progress and their agreed training program. How many people use driver records? I don't know of many that do, but if you do, you can get any documents out you've got, <laughs> you can get out. Um, you know, there's a thing later on we'll look at and it's called a reflective log. Uh, you can you can use anything you want, it can be handwritten notes, types of notes, whatever you normally use to keep track of your pupil's progress. If it's all in your head, that's fine. I tend to do that, I don't write much down, I do it in my head. You can tell them that, there's no shame in that, that's fine. They must display a valid ADI certificate when they attend their standards check if they're charging the people. They don't need to display, to display their certificate if they're not charging the people. Kind of irrelevant, you must show them your badge when you meet the examiner. Whether you're showing the windscreen or not, you know, you should if you're charging, but I mean, I've always done my standards check lessons for free. It's a great way of getting pupils to come along and do it. Just give them a free hour. Um, that's what most instructors do that I know. You must ask to see the certificate if it's not displayed. You must not continue with the standards check if they can't show you their valid ADI certificate. So it must be valid, must be up to date. should be obvious that goes without saying you've got to have a valid um, certificate to do this. You can make notes during the lesson to help you identify locations that may not be familiar to you. This is an important one. Many examiners, for the last two I've done my standards check and my last check test before that, and I've done five in total now over the years, so I've got good experience in five. I've done two part threes and three, well, two part threes, two check tests and a standards check. So I've done quite, a, quite an array of tests. The examiners very often don't know the area. This is something I don't like because the last two I've had, <coughs> I said to them, it's been great, the Maypole Roundabout, and they look you like, what? what's the Maypole Roundabout? And I do find it quite unfair when I know the roads better than they do, and they're telling you that you're not doing it right, and they don't even know the area. And it can be quite annoying that when you try and explain things to them and they don't really know which road you're talking about. You should destroy the notes as soon as possible after the standards check is complete. You know, just typical safety, you know, shred the notes so no one reads them. The only record of the standards check will be the completed report form. As I mentioned, the marking sheet, you'll get that. Other people present, again, a few more pages to go, then we'll go into the really meaty topics. You can be accompanied by a senior examiner to quality assure your assessment. So sometimes you do have two examiners in the back, like a learner can have two examiners in the back. One examiner assesses the other. Whenever possible, you will tell the IDI in advance when this is going to happen. If you, can't, if you couldn't tell the IDI before the assessment, five minutes will be allowed for the IDI to explain to the pupil what's happening. So if you turn up and you're going to have two examiners, you just get a bit of time to maybe go in the car, say to the people, look, um, you know, there's going to be an extra examiner in the back. You can't stand there, you've got to do it. And you're giving a bit of time just to kind of replan, you know, reassess. The lesson can include, if the IDI wishes, driving to the nearest garage or tyre centre to inflate the car's tyres to the recommended pressures for a heavier load. So if you want, you can drive to a garage and blow up the back tyres. Are you really going to do that? Probably not, because like where I am, I'm going to, the nearest garage is actually quite close to my test centre. But are you really going to do that? Do you really blow up your tyres more when the passenger gets in the back? Most people don't. Um, you can if you want, but again, they've got to say all this to cover themselves, haven't they? The idea, the ADI can be accompanied by the trainer slash mentor, but that person can't take part in the standards check lesson in any way. So, so if I was your trainer, you can take me along on your standards check so I can watch what's going on. But as it says, if a trainer mentor intends to accompany the ADI and the standards check is also planned for supervision, the supervising examiner will decide whether or not the supervision goes ahead. So if you don't like the thoughts of having two examiners, you can also take along a trainer, and if you say, look, I've already got someone coming with me, there's going to be three people in the back, they will sometimes say, okay, we won't supervise this one because it's 
three in the back is too much, you know, you will feel totally different in the car. That's really going to pull the people off, <laughs> having, having two examiners and you in the back. Um, so not you won't be in the back, you'll be in the front, <laughs> but <laughs> hopefully you'll be in the front. You won't, you'll have the people driving, you in the front, your trainer in the back plus two examiners in the back. What a full car that's going to be. <laughs> and what a load of stress that will be for you as well. So yeah, I've never had that happen. It's quite rare, of course, it happens, but it can. Next part, at the start of a standards check, when the ADI arrives at the test centre, you'll confirm their identity and complete the necessary paperwork. So yeah, they'll simply ask to see your badge, and they'll know your name, they'll check your name against your badge, and all that kind of stuff. The standards check requires the ADI to show their competence against all the criteria on the assessment form. Again, the marking sheet we mentioned before, the one I did a long video about, that's what you're being marked on. You should make sure the ADI understands what they are required to do, for example, by asking, do you have any questions about the standards check before we start? You probably have about a thousand questions, you won't have time to ask them. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I'm making these videos to help you out. Um, because it's fairly new, the one said to me the day, the examiner did ask me, um, have you, he, said, he did say, I suppose this is your first one, isn't it? And he did say, well, I think it's a pretty good new system. He says, I think it's better than the old check test. We had a quick talk about it for a minute, about how I said I think it's fairer. Um, so yeah, just to give you a quick chat, I suppose two or three years from now, if not 2019 onwards, they won't do that. Um, you'll then ask about the pupils' background and how much experience they've had. For example, you could say, could you tell me how many lessons your pupil has had and what you've been covering recently? So again, like I said before, they'll ask you quickly. They want a quick, you know, 30, 60 second chat about what you've been doing, what you've been working on. Again, don't go into too much detail, or you could make it harder for yourself. When you're satisfied that you have the information you need and that the ADI understands what's going to happen, you'll ask them to, con to, get, to continue with the lesson, for example, by saying thank you in your name. Carry on with this lesson in your normal way. Again, what a joke, because if you're going to carry on in, norm in a normal way on the standards check, I won't take any part in the lesson, and would you plan your lesson to be back here in one hour from now? Very important this. Now, mine was started at 12.30. The examiner actually came into the waiting room 12.32. It was a bit late. By the time I'd spoken to him, it was 12.35. By the time we walked to the car, it was 12.37. By the time I'd done my debrief, it was 12.42. We actually didn't start the check test till 12.42, 12 minutes after it should have begun. And he said to me, can you get back here at half one? So really, your standard check is only about 45 minutes long, depending on, you know, like mine, my test sender, you have quite a long walk, from the centre to your car is at least a two or three minute walk because you can't park outside. It's actually in a row of shops, my test centre. You have to park way down the road from the shops. The walk about, and it's probably about an eighth of a mile. You have to walk to the car. Um, so yeah, you don't actually get a full hour. It's a, you might do, depending where you are, if you park right outside the centre, maybe in a parking bay. But for me, it was only about 45 minutes. At the beginning of a standards check, an ADI should, normally, discuss the lesson plan and agree with the people. Where the IDI has had little or no experience of working with the people, they can suggest an assessment drive before finalising a lesson plan. However, the IDI should make sure enough time is available for development and feedback during the lesson. <coughs> so what that means is, um, if you've taken a complete stranger, like maybe your, your pupils lay you down and your neighbours had to come out and do it last minute, it's fine to go on a drive. You can just say, look, we've never worked be together before, we're going to go on a drive for about five minutes just to get a rough idea of what you need to do. That's going to be very hard to plan in five minutes. I think you need far more than five minutes. But what I'm saying is you can't do the entire thing as an assessment. Um, so they do want to see you working and giving feedback. They want to show you demonstrating all your skills. Um, so you've got to be able to do that. You can't just do the whole lesson as an assessment. The standards check will last for one hour. And the ADI should allow a minimum of 15 minutes at the end of the lesson for a debrief with the examiner. Very important this. Now on the old check test, whenever I did those, you were lucky if you got five minutes at the end. At the end, they just the people get out of the car, the examiner gets in the passenger seat, the market, there you go, five minute debrief, gone. Now on the standards check, he did actually walk away, walk back to the test centre, and he said, please give me 10 minutes to complete my report. He came back 12 minutes later, and he gave me a good 10 minute debrief, so you do get a lot of time now. I think they have told them you know, to spend more time with instructors talking about what happened. So 
you know, at the end of this, you finish to say half one. I don't think we moved from the parking space to about five to two. So it is about an hour and a half, you know, from the time you're supposed to begin <coughs> to the time you're driving off at the end. So at the end of the standards check, once the ADI has finished any reflective discussion with their people, you'll tell them that the test has finished, for example, by saying, thank you, um, your name. I now need to complete my paperwork. This was taking me about 10 minutes. I'll come and find you and give you some feedback on what I've seen. You're both welcome to wait in the waiting room. So you can go and wait in the waiting room, but I didn't. I just wait in the car talking to the people. The examiner should not debrief the ADI with the people present. However, the ADI may request a third party, such as their mentor, not the trainer, is present for the feedback. It should be noted the third party may act as an observer, but may not, may not take part in a may, may not take part in a discussion. So you can have someone watch the debrief, but they can't give any feedback on it. They can't, you know, they can't say, well, "I don't agree with that." It's like on a test, and you can't butt in. Completing the assessment, this way starts to get a little bit more detailed. The assessment is made against three broad or high areas of competence: <coughs> lesson planning risk management, teaching and learning strategies. So simply there are three big categories. There's the way you plan the lesson, the risk you put people at, and the way you teach. They're the three broad areas that you're marked on. The test marking sheet is at section 4.31. Again, later on it shows you a marking sheet in this document, the one I've already been over. Uh, sample SC1 standards check reporting form. The three high areas of competence are broken down further into 17 lower levels, lower level competencies, and a mark will be given for each of these lower level competencies. These marks will be totaled to give an overall mark, and they will also provide a profile of the areas where the IDI, where the IDI is strong, or where they need to do some more development work. So again, I've already been over this, so I won't go over this now. I've done this in my other video. Please watch that, it's off 57 minutes long. It goes over all this in great detail. Marks will be given as follows. No evidence of competence zero. A few elements of competence demonstrated one. Competence demonstrated in most elements two. Competence demonstrated in all elements three. So quite simply, the better you do, the higher score you get. I had quite a few threes on mine. I had a couple of ones because of an incident where quite simply people pulled out and around about and you shouldn't have an a break. And you get marked down heavily for that. Bit of a shame because... You know, I had said to the people at the beginning, I want you to be responsible for everything. And he normally does around about absolutely fine, no problems whatsoever. He messed it up <coughs> on my standards check and I got a one. So because I got, I think I got two or three ones on risk management, that's why I didn't get a grade A. So if, if we'd have gone a different way, if he hadn't pulled out at that time, <coughs> I would have got a grade A. So that's the fine line between an A and a B. You can be doing really well, last seconds of the test. One mistake, it's gone. Your grade A has gone, you're down to a B. It's so easy to, to do that. It doesn't matter about the grade, but if you do want to get a grade A, you know, you do need to think seriously about can your people handle every single junction you're going to. It is quite unfair in a way that members of the public can do crazy things, put you at risk. They can cut you up, blast the horn, and there goes your grade A just because someone else has been stupid. They cut you up. You can't predict it, they've just been stupid in the wrong lane. And yes, you can predict that, but... These things happen, and I've known instructors who have been on the grade A till the last five minutes of the test. They've done a mini round about something's gone wrong, failed. Could come from a grade A to a fail in seconds. It's so easy to do that. The key thing to understand is that the lower level competencies on the form can themselves be broken down into elements. The IDI, the ADI will have to use a range of skills to ensure each of these elements is in place. So quite simply, um, he says here, for example, the first lower level competence in the lesson planning section is did the ADI identify the pupils' learning goals and needs? To fully satisfy this requirement, the ADI must actively recognise the need to understand the pupils' experience and background, ask suitable questions, encourage the pupils to talk about their goals, concerns, and actively listen to what the pupil has to say, understand the significance of what they say, recognise other indications, e.g. body language, the people is trying to express something but perhaps cannot find the right words. Really important, body language is a massive thing now on these tests. You must make sure you're looking at people when you talk to them, you're noticing if they say, like you say, are you okay with that roundabout? Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. They're obviously not fine, they've said, oh, yeah, that's okay. You've got to pick up on that. 
and I think there's one more over the page. No. Um, now I got a three, a full score for doing that because I, I'd read this and I knew about this. And he said that was really good. You know, you, you know, you look to the people while you notice what they were doing. I asked the questions. You've got to pay attention to this. If you miss any of those things, you'll get, uh, for example, a two. And he does come back to this at the moment. He does say, and it's in a bit later on in his document. If you do everything, but maybe you don't, um, you just don't look at the body language. You miss the fact that they would be nervous. They're going to fidget in like this, and they're, they're nervous. You'll get a two. It's very hard to get a three in any box. So if you get any threes whatsoever, well done, because threes are not easy to come by at all. Okay, the only thing that let me down is I got ones for some risk management because the people pulled out. Um, <laughs> because that can happen. We all have that happen, don't we? People's polite junctions is what they do. Not what they normally do, but it's what they do on the standards check. Anyway, so next page, page 64. So we're almost, what, about a sixth of the way through. These are what we mean by the elements. Another way to express it would be to think of these as the building blocks which go to make up the lower level competence which is being assessed. For further explanation, go to 4.32, we'll be going to that later on. Competent standards examples. An ADI who makes no attempt to understand their pupils' needs will be demonstrating no, ev no evidence of competence and be marked zero. <coughs> an ADI who makes an attempt, asks a few questions, but doesn't really listen, and then goes ahead and does what they intend to do regardless, will be demonstrating a few elements of competence and will be marked one. Now that's what a lot of instructors do. You might get in the car, you try and ask them what they'd like to work on, you ask a few questions, but then you go and do a lesson which doesn't match what they say, you'll get a one. It's very easy to get marked as a one, and that sounds harsh, but it's the way it works. An ADI who grasps the importance of understanding the pupil's needs and makes a real effort to do so, but who finds it difficult to frame suitable questions, will be demonstrating competence in most elements and will be marked two. So in other words, if you really try and you get it right, but you maybe don't quite get it right, you're doing well and you're trying, you'll get a two. But it, there is a quite difference between a one and a two. A two means you just kind of missed a few things, whereas one means you kind of missed the point of what was going on. Competence development. Another way to look at this form, and so another way to look at this is from a development point of view. If the examiner gives to the ADR score of three, the examiner is effectively saying that this is an area where the ADI does not need to work any further, apart from continuously reflecting on their performance. That's what you've got to do. That's what I do now. Yes, I went and got a grade B the other day. I've reflected on that. If I went and did it today, I'd probably get a grade A because I've reflected on what I've done. That's what the point of this is. It's not just about, you know, oh, I've got a grade A, I'm the best ever, nothing I can improve, and then you'll have a shock when you're going to get a grade B next time. You've got to keep developing your skill all the time. If they give a score of two, they are saying that the ADI's performance is acceptable. <coughs> so, but there are clear areas where they could improve. If they give a score of one, they are saying the ADI's performance is not acceptable and the ADI needs to do a lot more work, even though they give evidence of knowing what they are supposed to be doing. They're being harsh that because it's not that it's not that you need to do a lot more work, it might just be you understand this check, you messed it up, you gotta be nervous, you messed it up. You maybe you normally do fine. So I don't really agree with that. <coughs> you might normally do really well. You just messed up on that one day. You don't really need to work on it. You just messed up. Consistent marking. This is something I do a lot when I do standards, mock standards checks. It is important that any assessment demonstrates consistency across each area of competence. The following is an example of inconsistent marking. Did the trainer identify the pupil's learning goals and needs? Zero. Was the lesson was the agreed lesson structure tailored to the pupils' experience and ability? Two or three. So you can't have a zero on not knowing what the goals were and get a three on structuring a proper lesson. You can't have structured a proper lesson if you don't know what the goals were. And this is why it takes some ten minutes at the end to go and mark it because you just take a while. You look at the video I did with um, the instructor. I did a mock standards check with. It takes a while to mark it. <coughs> it took me about forty-eight minutes. <laughs> so. This is inconsistent because there was no, there has been, if there has been no meaningful attempt to identify the pupils' learning goals, it is not possible for a lesson structure to be either agreed or appropriate. An ADI may have knowledge of pupils' learning goals from earlier lessons. If this becomes clear during the lesson, then logically, it would also be wrong to give a zero against the first competence. 
the maximum our can ADR can gain is 51 and the score achieved would it take the final grade it's a C grading later on for the guidelines again I've done that in the other video whatever their overall marks an ADR will automatically fail if they achieve a score of 7 or less on risk management at any point in the lesson behave in a way which puts you the people or any third party in immediate danger so that you have to stop the lesson so quite simply if you get seven or less in risk management you'll fail automatically even if you get four marks in every other area if anything's a bit risky you'll fail it's so easy for that to happen you have one bad junction one slip of the clutch there goes your whole lesson it's really really tense when you're doing a standards check my experience is that I will not stop a lesson unless it's really, really bad. Like if you pull out of the junction, even if you cut someone up, even if they blast the horn, they won't normally stop the lesson. If you were kind of sitting back chatting with the people about what you did at the weekend and you're not even looking and you pull out, they will. So you've got to be on the ball, but you know, obviously you've got to be safe when you're doing a lesson. Um, so it says, see notes about recording grades in these circumstances. Later on, there's a section of this coming up quite soon, I think, yeah, where they tell the examiner <coughs> how to mark the test in terms of how to report it to the DVSA, because they have to send to these codes, you know, different codes for different things. You don't need to know about that, but I'll go over it very quickly. Like they put, I'll do when we get there, but they put these codes they send through to show what your score was. Um, what it means is one well last page there is that if you've been working with your pupil for a long time, you don't have to necessarily sit and do um, a five-minute debrief because you may be, you just say, well, you know, you know what we did last lesson, yeah, we're going to carry on doing that. You wouldn't just say that quickly, but you just say later on that it is okay to, to not do a full debrief, a full briefing with every single pupil if you've been working together for ages. And this is only that I checked with the examiner. I said to him, am I supposed to introduce myself to the people? And he said, no, no, don't believe that rubbish. He said, I had someone the other day, they'd been doing 30 hours together. And he was saying to him at the beginning, my name's John, is your name? And he said, I said to him at the end, why were you introducing yourself to a people you've been working with for 30 hours? So it is quite realistic. You know, you don't have to do any fake stuff on your standards check in terms of pretending you don't know them or anything like that. So it's quite simply says, um, you'll know the grade the ADI, the ADI has achieved. I can never say that. You will note the grade the ADI has achieved on the assessment form and give them a copy. So you get a copy and they keep a copy. You will also offer feedback on the ADI's overall performance using the profile of the marks you were given them as a basis. No other written report will be made as performance and development needs are clearly identified on the assessment form. Detailed guidance on the interpretation of the questions on the test form is set out at 4.32. So quite simply all that means at the end they'll give you a copy of the sheet. Complaints procedure. If ADIs feel that their standards check wasn't conducted properly they should follow the complaints procedure. However they can't appeal against your decision. The complaints procedure can be found here and it gives a link. Um, so you, can, you can't say I don't think I should have got an A and I got a B. You can say for example I don't think you did it properly because, um, like in mine, I mean, you'll know from my watching my videos, there's something about mine I don't agree with. I mean, I, he got it wrong and I know he got it wrong because he didn't know the area and he said I did a roundabout wrong when I didn't. And I know that roundabout well, it catches everyone out. That is how you do it, but he didn't know the area. But you can't appeal against that. You can appeal if, for example, they weren't paying attention if the examiner was sitting texting on his phone or if you think that they discriminate against you in some way you can appeal against that, but not the actual decision. The decision will stand regardless of even if your appeal is upheld. I think you'll get like that chance back because you get three chances to pass. How you would prove it wasn't done properly is extremely hard. But let's say they didn't mark it properly. If they gave you a zero and a three in the same area, as I mentioned before, you could say that wasn't marked properly. I want it done again. ADI cancellation or failure to attend. If an ADI fails to attend, FTA, that's the codes I was talking about earlier on. At the date and time set out in the invite, the examiner's outlook diary should be marked FTA and the sector FTA register should also be updated. This is all just examiner talk, it's like the, the systems they have to book you in on. They have to click to certain things to say it didn't turn up. Where an ADI cancels a standards check, the reason for cancellation should be recorded in the examiner's outlook diary. So if you cancel because you're ill or whatever, you know, they might have to take it into account. I wouldn't want to go cancelling one <coughs> unless you've really got it, but if you do, they'll record the reason why. The standards check will be recorded as an FTA 
and the CADI provides adequate evidence to justify the cancellation. So in other words, you can't just say I'm tired. Um, if you say people didn't turn up, again, I've done a separate video about this, but if your people doesn't turn up, you tell them, they will ask for your people's name, phone number and address to contact them and check what the people, what happens if the people lies and says they didn't cancel it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't suppose they would be if they did. Um, that would be awkward. In the event of cancellation or FTA, the standards check booking team can tell the registrar who can consider removing the ADI from the register. So if you just simply don't bother turning up or you cancel, like say, oh, I'm tired, don't want to do it, they can remove you straight away. Very rarely would they do that because it would open up too many legal problems, you could sue them, whatever. But it's pretty obvious you don't want to cancel a standards check. If you are real, what I recommend recommend is turn up. <coughs> Sorry, a bit of a cough. If you are real, turn up and show them that you're real. Show them, you know, you show them that you've got a, a cough line now, whatever. Show them that you're tired, you know, you, you've got the pneumonia, whatever you've got. Show them that you're real. And don't just, you know, unless you really, really and you can't. Show them, turn up and show them. So the next page, I'm not going to read through all this again. This is done in a separate video about the letter. Uh, next, yeah, next two pages, just a letter that you get from the examiners. It's quite self-explanatory. It just tells you, this is your standards check. You'll need to bring along a car, obviously. I don't know if you can ever turn up without a car. But I'll go through that in a separate video, because that's not so much for this one. So now on to the next section. Get only a few more pages, and I will get into the meaty, you know, the real big topics when they go over. Management of standards checks. Preparation of documents. Before the IDI arrives, you should make sure you have prepared the reporting form for the standards check. You should enter the IDI's details on the form. If the IDI fails to attend or the standards check cannot go ahead because the IDI is late and there is a shortage of time before the next test, you should note that failure in your diary and contact the bookings team with the details as soon as possible. You keep saying your Outlook diary, it's just the way they, they call it the Outlook diary, I'll just call it the diary. So if you don't turn up, he just says that the examiner's got to tell them that. Pretty self-explanatory. Greeting the IDI. We've already really been over this. When the IDI arrives, you should introduce yourself courteously. You should wear your name badge. Please remember that shaking hands is not acceptable to everybody. I told you not to shake hands unless you put your hand out first. You know, different religions or whatever. People have different things they don't want to do. You must check the identity of the person who has presented themselves for the check. And that's, that's confusing for the check. I was going to say a check test. Um, you must identify the, the per, you must check the identity of the person who has presented themselves for the check and has to see their ADI registration certificate badge. If the people they have brought with them is paying for the lesson, their ADI certificate badge must be displayed. If they are not paying, then the certificate need not be displayed. However, in either case, if the ADI cannot produce their ADI certificate, you should not proceed with the standards check. Again, it's already said this before, if you haven't got your green badge with you, then you can't do it. Um, in the future, they are saying the standards check is going to replace the part three, so you may have a red or a pink badge. As long as you've got your badge, if you standards check, that's fine. If the ADI attends without people, you should refer them to the requirements in the invitation letter and inform them they will be contacted by DVSA. So in other words, if you, if you turn up without people, not knowing that you needed one, they'll tell you you need a people and you'll have another one booked. Not an enormous problem. So I did ask this. So I asked the examiner on my standards check, what happens if you turn up without a people? And he said, oh, it's no big deal. We'll just book you another one. I was surprised by that. I thought it would be a big problem, but he said, no, it doesn't matter. He said, you know, you don't, you don't, want, to, don't want to do it, but it happens where people's cancel. So no big worry. Don't worry about that. And that will, I will have gone over in a separate video. It is the ADI's responsibility to make sure the vehicle provided has the correct insurance cover in place. Obviously, you've got to be covered. I think pretty much all um, ADI insurance companies will know you do standards checks. You, you normally cover, but if you're not sure, check. Where there is any doubt about whether insurance is in place, the test should not proceed, obviously. If the ADI offers to supply training documents, such as a reflective log, you should discuss the content with them, but if they do not bring such papers, this will not invalidate the standards check. So in other words, if you turn up and you've got no documents, you don't do a driver record, you don't write down notes, doesn't matter, you don't have to. Vehicle to be used. The vehicle used for a standards check must meet minimum test requirements, and as far as you are able to tell, be roadworthy and safe. <laughs> so they're just saying that 
the examiner's not, not a mechanic, they can't check the car thoroughly, but they, they will have a quick look at your tyres. You know, if there's any stone nail sticking out your tyres or whatever, they won't do it. I had that happen to me the, the two days before my standards check, I got a screw in the tyre, and there was a third one I'd had in a month. Don't know what's going on, I had three screws in the tyre in a month. But once I had to pay for it to be repaired, next one I got a free tyre, next one it was just sticking in a bit, this pulled it out. Hadn't even gone in the tyre, but yeah, you do need to check your car thoroughly before doing a standards check. Soft top convertibles are not acceptable, nor are 2 plus 2 vehicles where seating arrangements in the back are inadequate. So you can't do it in a soft top, I think it's because if the car rolls over, they're not safe. If you rolls over, you've, you've failed anyway. <laughs> um, you can't tag 2 plus 2. If you don't know, a 2 plus 2 is if you like, I think the Peugeot 206 convertible is a 2 plus 2. It's the two seats in the back. And only two, so two in the front and only two in the back. There isn't a bit in the middle. It's just like um, a ridge or there's, like, there's not a bit in the middle. It's two in the front, two in the back. Quite rare those cars, but I don't think anyone will be teaching in those anyway. L plates or D plates in Wales should be fitted if the ADI is teaching a learner. So if you want, if you're the learner, you must have your plates on. Of course, this is all self-explanatory. Rear seat belts in working order must be fitted and must be used. Of course. If there is a facility of rear head, rear head restraint, these must be fitted to ensure your safety and suitable insurance must be in place. Again, it's already said that. So if you have any doubts about car suitability, or if the ADI proposes you using a small vehicle which has limited passenger space in the rear, the ADI should notify the standards check booking section. So if you do have something like a, well, yeah, a tiny tire, not like a small car, Fiesta's fine, Corsa's fine. If you've got a really small car, like something really unusual, like, you know, a kind of odd car that not many people have. It might be worth phoning them up and checking with them. Failure to attend in a suitable car could result in the ADR's removal from the register. So if you turn up in a two-seater Ferrari, you'll probably be removed from the register. Not that you'd probably care if you had a two-seater Ferrari. Rules for, cars, or rules for cars used for driving tests can be found on gov.uk. Risk management, very quick on this. You should not, will, you should not willfully place yourself the ADI or whether road users are at risk any time. So the examiner shouldn't do anything that's going to put you in danger. Quite obvious. But it's all obvious, so we'll go on to the main bit soon. I keep saying that. I'm just going through this quickly. But it's going to be a long video already, so I'm trying to get through this part fairly quick. Assessment. Again, it repeats itself. Your role is to assess the ADR's competence to deliver effective driving instruction. The national standard for driving and rider training is expressed in terms of learning outcomes. And there, may be more, there may be more than one way for the ADI to achieve those outcomes. Of course, if an ADI does or says something that is clearly wrong, it is important that you pick this up, especially where it could lead to a safety issue. However, your overall approach should be focused on recognising achievement and promoting improvement and development rather than purely identifying faults. So all it's saying there is there's more than one way to achieve the end result. Um, you don't have to do this and that. You can do whatever methods you want, whatever... Um, practice you want, whatever areas you want, as long as it's suitable. <laughs> so if you're teaching left turns, you don't have to go left, 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 left around the block. Um, you know, there's no set way they're looking for. It's whatever works, works. Um, and they do try and say what you did well. But the one I did didn't do this. My examiner just said everything I'd done wrong. Didn't really praise any of the good things I'd done. So he didn't really follow this to that extent. The ADI's task is to provide an effective learning experience for the pupil. An effective learning experience is just to be one in which the pupil is supported to take as much responsibility as possible for their learning process. So again, um, it's just about, you know, the pup learning comes from the pupil, as we'll be going over later on. It just means that you shouldn't be instructing too much. You should be letting the learner learn, which is what I did and got marked down for. Um, but again, that was simply because I said to the learner, I want you to do everything on your own, because he normally does. And then he just messed it up. Okay, the ADI should, where it is correct and safe to do so, <coughs> feel free to introduce wider issues from the driving standard to the lesson, such as assessing personal fitness to drive, the use of alcohol or drugs, or dealing with aggression. So it doesn't have to be a topic, like I said, it doesn't have to be turning left, turning right, you know, roundabouts. It can be a lesson on how to feel more relaxed when driving. It can be a lesson on, you know, maybe they've been caught drink driving, do a lesson on why they shouldn't. You can do anything you want, it doesn't have to be. And the lesson I did was um, reducing, a chan reducing your chances of crashing after passing. So it wasn't a set topic as such. Um, 
the whole lesson plan fell apart after about three minutes because what happened on the roundabout, we completely scrapped what I was going to do, the whole route went out the window, we ended up doing the same roundabout over and over again. And um, I've spoken about that in my other videos, but you must be able to change your plan <coughs> accordingly. Interestingly, the examiner suggested that maybe I shouldn't have done that and I should have carried on with the original plan, which I find bizarre because the pupils nearly crashed in the roundabout and I'm supposed to ignore that and carry on with the lesson plan. Don't really know what he's talking about there. Again, the examiner I got was quite strange. Um, it was a really nice bloke all the way through, and then at the very end, he seemed to start coming out with some really strange things that I didn't really understand, but I've, I'll have done another video on that. Again, this video is focused on ADI 1, and the main meaty things I'm getting to very soon, three pages time, that's what this is about. So, where, where the ADI should work is correct and safe to do so, feel free to introduce wider issues. If, for example, the people offers <coughs> an inappropriate comment about the use of alcohol, it would be appropriate for the ADI to challenge this. Similarly, it would be appropriate for the ADI to encourage the people to think through what might happen in particular situations if the conditions were different. For example, after negotiating a particularly difficult junction, it might be helpful to discuss how different it will be in night or in bad weather. The important thing to remember here is that the most effective learning takes place when the pupil finds the answers for themselves. That is a really important sentence. Let's read that again. The important thing to remember here is that the most effective learning takes place when the pupil finds the answers for themselves. That is what it's all about. And that's one little sentence there in the whole 30 pages. And that one sentence is really, really important. That will tell you what you should be doing on your whole test. You must be placing the people at the centre of everything, not just talking at them and telling them this is what we do, this is what we do. You've got to put the people in the middle and make the learning come from them. So what it's meaning by this is, if the people say something like, oh, I can't see anything wrong with having a quick drink before I drive, and you say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll normally have a couple of pints before I lesson myself. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone would ever do that. But there it is, you know, that you can't agree with risky attitudes. If opportunities arise for discussion of issues between the idea and the people while on the move, these can be used. But it needs to be tailored to the pupil's ability and should not create distraction. Too many unnecessary instructions from the IDI can both demotivate the people and cause a real hazard. Remember it is an offence to use a mobile phone while driving because this is known to create a level of risk equivalent to, or in some cases greater, than driving whilst drunk. It cannot therefore be good practice to constantly bombard the people with the necessary questions. Really important again, another sentence which you can easily overread and skip over. It's really, really important. Um, you shouldn't be bombarding the people with questions. So they're coming into a really busy junction and they're struggling to do it, they're looking, they're looking, and you start saying, So do you think this will be safe if you were drunk? Do you think this will be safe at night time? Do you think this will be different if you're on your phone? And they can't answer because they're struggling through the junction. So pretty obvious stuff, but you've got to talk about things at an appropriate time. Recording assessment. In normal circumstances, you should record your assessment on the assessment form immediately after the standards check has been completed, taking into account the guidance given and above. Again, this is just understanding. Wait till you've finished, then mark, then make a nod, mark. Make a note of the marks. You should record the main subject of the lesson and what level of experience the people is said to have, e.g. FLH for a full licence holder. If at any point during the lesson the IDI behaves and behaves in a way which puts you, the people, and any third party in immediate in immediate danger, then you should stop the lesson. So I've got hiccups. You should put a tick in the appropriate yes box in the review section and mark the form as a fail. It's already said this if it's repeating itself, it's saying about if you put people at risk, it should be a fail. If the ADR scores seven or less, you know, in the risk management you'll fail, we've already said that. If you have stopped less than recorded fail, we've already said that. Um, assuming you don't have to record an automatic fail, <coughs> the marks given should be totaled to, to, to determine the grade given the grade achieved. So in other words, they'll mark you on each topic, then they add it up, then they get a the grade. They don't normally do it like think, well that was a grade A, give them an A, and then give them high marks. The way I do is you don't actually know what grade they've got till you add it up. You mark that, mark that, mark that. 17 marks, add them up, oh it's a grade B. That's how it works. So that's why the grades aren't so important because it doesn't really matter A or B, 
you can get one extra mark at an A, one less get a B. Does it really make any difference? Um, so that's that. At the end of the standards check, the outcome will be marked yeah. with a grade A, B or fail, as you mentioned. Documentation, again, this is more for the examiners, but I'll go over it quickly. I need one, one or two more pages, and then we get to the main stuff. So the top copy to be, to be sorry, documentation. The top copy of the completed assessment form should be handed to the ADI following the verbal feedback. So again, it's already said that. They'll give you a sheet of paper. The second and third copy is for the examiner's records and should be stored in line with the guidance provided. Where the third and satisfactory standards check takes place, the third copy of the report form should be marked third attempt and posted to their address. So in other words, it's saying this person isn't good enough, you know, look into it. If you fail three times, you normally lose your badge, but they can give you another attempt or let you continue teaching. It depends why you failed. So it's not the case of three strikes in your aim. Normally it is, but there are circumstances where it wouldn't be, depending on why you failed. Giving feedback, when you finish filling in the form, you should inform the IDI of the grade they have achieved. If you have assessed them as a failed, they must be told clearly that the instruction is not an acceptable level. So if you fail, they will say you failed and this is not good enough, you've got to get better, obviously. Depending on the reasons for the unsatisfactory assessment, the IDI should be told they need to have a further standards check and the booking teams will contact them. If you don't pass first time, you'll only normally get another one within two or three weeks. They don't waste time. If you're not up to standard, you will have another one very soon, two, three, four weeks away. Not always, but it depends on you. Know, they will put you as a priority. He does mention this in a moment. There is a priority list for instructors who are deemed dangerous or not very good. And the priority list, of course, they book them in before the normal ones. So if you get a grade A, they kind of leave you alone a bit more. Grade B, you kind of higher up the list, but not, you know, you're not over by the top. Um, and if you're marked as you know, dangerous, you go right to the top of the list, even above people who are due a standards check soon. You get right priority, you've got to be seen again soon. And again, it just says the same stuff here. I won't read all this page because all it says, you know, the purpose of feedback is to try to understand where you've gone wrong. Um, the scores tell you what you did wrong. It's all obvious. This It tells you all this. I've already read through previous pages, it tells you the same things. Um, so yeah, there's that. Okay, I'm not going to skip over all this, but these things are just, it's just, it's already said this before. Um, <coughs> substandard tests. At the end of the day, they must have had a diary and sent through details of any substandard tests. Yep, yeah, that's what I just mentioned. These are the um, the marks I told you about. So for past, they'll, they'll mark you as A stroke 49. So, for example, if you get a B, they might send the score through as B stroke 36. So that's how it looks when you go online and look up your grade, if you do that. <laughs> um, if you failed, it will say fail um, stroke 2. So that means you've failed and it's your second attempt. Um, if you've failed one, then got an automatic fail on risk management, then that will be your first one. It would say fail stroke, stroke auto stroke 1. You don't need to know this, just the, the way that they mark it, they assess it. Um, you must highlight the recorded results on all sub on all second substandard check tests that you enter on your diary. Again, this page you're just talking loads of acronyms and loads of briefings. And it's just saying to me if, if an exam if, if an instructor fails, just tell us and we'll get them in the test soon. That's all this page says. And it's all just guidelines for the examiner of what they need to do. So one more little bit, and then we'll get on to the main part. So you must file all standards check reports in a safe and secure location, of course. This could be at a central location or an individual test centre. So simply saying something, you've got to record the file. The file and, <coughs> sorry, you've got to record the file and store the documentation in the right place. It tells them about contacting the bookings team and they contact the team and they'll get you another test soon, as we just said. And then the next paragraph again is all about, it's just the same stuff, it's about to contact us and tell us what needs to be done. So for the moment, I'm going to leave it there. Now this video will continue, but I'm going to go for a quick break. So I've been filming there for a good or half hour or so. The next part is the main part. This is the main, I could be saying the main meaty section that we need to get into. I may even split this video into three parts. So it'll be three different videos or two, I don't know. Probably be one long video, but that's just a quick overview of the, what you need to know about standards checks, so the way it's marked. Again, I have done another video about that, but let's carry on now 
with the main things, the really important, big, chunky topics that I really want to get into.